I've been reading uh, St. Augustine every day for the last couple of weeks and I've been very blessed. I just finished his short book called On Grace and Free Will. I'll leave a link in the description of uh, it's available for free online and I bought it on Kindle for about a dollar so I definitely recommend it. Uh, I'll be reading from chapter 41. Um, Augustine presents a very balanced view. He does teach free will but he defines it essentially as our own ability to accept or refuse certain things. He emphasizes human responsibility in the opening chapters of the book but then especially at the last chapters he really seems to have a very strong view of unconditional election. And so allow me to present a quick case that this is true and therefore contradicts Roman and Eastern Christianity and is more in line with classical Reformed and Protestant views. That grace is in God's hands, he saves as he pleases, we cannot do anything good outside of God's grace. We have no merits, only evil merits before we are saved. Faith is a gift, he teaches very clearly. And we are in God's hands. He saves as he pleases. He chooses us that we would choose him. He chooses and loves us first that we would love and choose him and believe. This is Augustine's clear view, but in this passage, let's see what he says. I think I have now discussed the point fully enough in opposition to those who vehemently oppose the grace of God. So this is near the end of the book. By which... However, the human will is not taken away, but changed from bad to good, and assisted when it is good. I think, too, that I have so discussed the subject, that it is not so much I myself as the inspired scripture, which has spoken to you, in the clearest testimonies of truth. And if this divine record be looked at, are looked into carefully, it shows us that not only men's good wills, which God himself converts from bad ones, and when converted by him, directs to good actions and to eternal life, but also those which follow the world are so entirely at the disposal of God that he turns them wherever he wills and whenever he wills to bestow kindness on, on some, and to heap punishment on others, as he himself judges right by a counsel most secret to himself, indeed, but beyond all doubt, most righteous. So there's a reason Luther and Calvin love to quote from Augustine. They had very similar views on predestination. He goes on, For we find that some sins are even the punishment of other sins, as are those vessels of wrath, which are the which the apostle describes as fitted to destruction, Romans nine twenty two, as is also the, that hardening of Pharaoh, the purpose of which is said to be set forth in him the power of God, as again is the flight of the Israelites from the face of the enemy before the city of Ai. For fear arose in their hearts, so that they fled, and this was done, that their sin might be punished in the way it was right that it should be, by reason of which the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, The children of Israel shall not be able to stand before the face of their enemies. What is the meaning of? They shall be not able to stand. Now why did they not stand by free will, but with a will perplexed by fear, took to flight, were it not that God has the lordship even over men's wills, and when he is angry, turns to fear whomsoever he pleases. Was it not of their own will that the enemies of the children of Israel fought against the people of God, as led by Joshua the son of Nun? And yet the scripture says, it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that they might be exterminated. Joshua 11 verse 20. And it was not, and was it not likewise of his own will that the wicked son of Gera cursed King David? And yet, what says David, full of true and deep and pious wisdom, what did he say to him who wanted to smite the reviler? 
What, said he, have I to do with you, you sons of Jeruiah? Let him alone, and let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse, David. Who then shall say, Wherefore have you done so? Second Samuel 16, 9-10 And then the inspired scripture, as if it would confirm the king's profound utterance by repeating it once more, tells us, And David said to Abishai, and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth from my bowels, seeks my life. How much more may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord has bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on my humiliation, and will requite me for good. Requite me good for his cursing this day. Second Samuel 16:11 to 10 now what prudent reader will fail to understand in what way the Lord bade this profane man to curse David? It was not by a command that he bade him, in which case his obedience would be praiseworthy, but he inclined the man's will, which had become debased by his own perverseness, to commit this sin by his own just and secret judgment. Therefore it is said, the Lord said to him, now if this person had obeyed a command of God, he would have deserved to be praised rather than punished, as we know he was afterwards punished for this sin. Now, uh, nor is the reason an obscure one why the Lord told him after this manner to curse David. It may be, said the humbled king, that the Lord will look on my humiliation, and will requite me good for his cursing this day. See then, what proof we have here that God uses the hearts of even wicked men for the praise and assistance of the good. Thus did he make use of Judas when betraying Jesus. Thus did he make use of the Jews when they crucified Christ. And how vast the blessings which from these instances he has bestowed upon the nations that should believe in him. He also uses our worst enemy, the devil himself, but in the best way, to exercise and try the faith and piety of good men, not for himself indeed, who knows all things before they come to pass, but for our sakes, for whom it was necessary that such, dis such a discipline should be gone through with us. So, as we should know already, Augustine is declared a saint and doctor of the Roman Catholic Church and also a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And yet, he seems to have completely different views on grace and God's election and predestination than them. They should pay attention to him. This is biblical. God is in control of everything. God is sovereign over our souls. We depend completely on his grace. We are unworthy. We are not entitled to grace. It is His grace to give. He is sovereign. It is His free will. And not on the basis of our own. We don't get the ultimate decision, but God gets the ultimate decision. And we are responsible. Yes, indeed, all evil comes from ourselves. But God, God turns the will. Because without His turning, without His grace, we would only reject. We would only turn from God. As it clearly teaches in John, uh, John chapter 3, Ephesians 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, many other places. And this sovereign view of Augustine and Calvin and Luther is clearly taught in passages like Ephesians 1, Hebrew, uh, sorry, uh, Proverbs 16. The Lord hath made everything for himself, yea, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil, Proverbs 16, 4. Let us consider these things carefully. Yes, there are mysteries. All evil comes from the creature. God is never the agent of evil. But he is sovereign. He overrides evil for his own good, his own glorious purposes, even loving redemption. Through Christ the Lord, Jesus was crucified. It was the greatest evil of man, and yet God overrode that evil. And that murder of Jesus Christ to bring salvation to countless people by the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we praise him for his glorious grace forever.